by 1932, the, uh, the M type and the D type were pretty old hat. The D type because it wouldn't go, and the M type because it was simply old fashioned. Um, and so along comes the J series, which is a C type chassis with uh, an updated engine um, with twin carburetors, slab tank at the rear, and the J2 is the, the first production car to have the slab tank. And the, and the uh, scuttle cowls, which uh, it inherited from the C-type. The J-series came in four different sorts. Um, I warned you about the complications. There was a J-1, which is a four-seater. J-2, which is the two-seater, that's the popular one. There was a J-3, which is a supercharged J-2. And the J-4, which is now an out racing car, supercharged racing car. This, this is a 1932 J-2. It was built uh, right around the end of December in 1932, and uh, just probably just before the Christmas break, according to the records. And it's restored to be as original as it can be with its uh, vacuum wiper motor and the, the horn and everything. It's, it's done, we've done quite a bit of research just trying to figure out what is original, and there's, you always run into variations on what should be right. It's in its uh, original colors. Uh, with the, you know, the, uh, got its, uh, with the seats, you know, the, the, they painted them all sorts of different colors. You could get the two tones. There were a lot of, you know, like there was green and, and gray and red and the blue. Uh, you could get them with uh, variations in the leather. You could get them solid colors with, with black uh, exteriors. The factory would do just about anything that you wanted them to do for a, a price. It says that in the, basically says that in the sales brochures. Well, the the M-Type, had the, the boat tail body came in you know it was basically a Morris Minor chassis or when you got into the 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 D's and and the the like F1 you started to get into a chassis that was that was designed after uh, the C type racer which you know those those were very close the J used that chassis it was more of a racing derived chassis than the M type um, the lower end of the engine is is basically M type what sets it apart from the M-Type, though, is it's got a cross-flow cylinder head. Um, it gives it a little more horsepower because of that. After, you know, when you get into, the, like, the PA, you get into a, a car that has bigger brakes than the J. You know, that was one of the main refinements. Just minor creature refinements to the body. Uh, nice burled walnut dashboard, maybe. The J has the, the uh, turn dashboard. Um, a lot of creature comforts. The biggest thing with the P, though, uh, besides for the brakes, is it has a three main bearing uh, crankshaft. This one has two bearings. And the, the biggest thing about the, the J that gave it kind of a bad name at the time was you could easily twist the crankshaft in two. People would tune the thing, get out there and race, try to, try to meet the, uh, the speeds that were quoted in the auto car, which was about 80 miles an hour, and it'd break, break the crankshaft, and then they were mad at the factory. So. The factory came out with a three main bearing crankshaft partially in response to that. Uh, but uh, the thing about the J is that I like about it is that it, it's really the first car to carry the, the classic MG design. The, MT, the, uh, the M type is really cute with its boat tail, but this you get into the design that where they actually started to look like MGs. And uh, this is an early one with the, the cycle fenders and about. Uh, I'm going to say mid-33, I'm not exactly sure of the date, they started going to the, the swept fenders, swept wings if you prefer, uh, that you see on the TC. And so you've, you've got all the basic elements of the later cars. Well, it, it drives very well. You, you always hear, you hear about uh, the brakes and stuff being weak because it's the small 8-inch brakes. Once they were set up right, uh, it stops very well. It, according to the speedometer, it will run about 65 miles an hour. It, uh, when you get into something like city traffic, it's a little, you're a little nervous because you don't have quite the pickup of a new Ford or something, and they're a lot bigger than you are. Uh, I have the, the single small tail light in the back, which you wonder if anybody can see. Uh, originally, it didn't even have a brake light, uh, but it, this one does. Uh, it's kind of a concession to safety. Um, but as far as steering and handling, it, it steers, you know, just like they always say, just on rails. It's very fun. Uh, everybody looks at you as you drive by. Every, everybody who 
you know, they all look at the cycle fenders and say, that's great, that's, that's early MG. But the, the bad part about the cycle fenders is anything the front tires run over yeah, gets flipped yeah. up and if it doesn't hit your, your elbow, then it will hit your back fender and chip the paint. So, uh, one of the funnier stories is right after we got it together, a friend and I went riding out in the country and we go through some stuff that, that looks like, you know, it's just stuff in the road. And he goes, ooh, and he raises his arm up and we'd run through cow manure and it, you know, just literally coated his arm on the side of the car. And I think he kind of lost his, before that he was praising the cycle fenders, saying how great they were. He didn't say anything more about it after that. <laughs> but uh, that's one of the, I suppose you might have had that problem in the 30s. <laughs> this is a 1933 J4. Uh, <clears throat> all-out racing car. Uh, doors do not open here, which makes this a little different than the other J's. Plus a supercharger. And this is one of the original Power Plus superchargers. This happens to be number eight. Normally they were number six. They were, uh, number six was used, but as an option, you could buy a number eight, and this is what this is, a large one, number eight. Uh, producing about 80 horsepower, top speed about 120, 750cc engine. And it's a little tricky to drive, especially from a standing start. I took this car to a hill climb one day, my first time out racing it. And revved up the motor and released the clutch and the whole thing just died. Because one cancels out the other. So what happens here, you have to slip the clutch for about 50 feet. Then it starts to take hold. And after you get the thing rolling, then there's no problem. But from a standing start, you need to slip the clutch for a while. There are quite a few outstanding features about these cars. Uh, one thing, it has a torque reaction cable here to prevent your, your front axle beam from, from twisting and hard braking. It has mechanical brakes and during the race you can adjust your brakes while racing. There's a little knob above the transmission because these were made for a 500 mile race and during the race you would you use out your brake lining you could take up the adjustment while racing. And the J4, which is now, now a racing car, supercharged racing car, the J4 was a terrifyingly fast vehicle, which um, is the only MG to have killed people in racing. It really was too fast for its chassis. It was, um, it was developing something in excess of 70 horsepower. This is only three years after the M-types were developing 18. This is, this is development. I drove this car in a vintage race at Watkins Glen in 1979. We had a, a, a vintage car race prior to the Grand Prix of the United States. And I was going along happily. Suddenly I hit a, a bump in the road on a number 11 turn, I believe, where the old course I met the new course. There was a lip in the pavement. And I felt it going around each time, but this time I got a little bit more airborne and I found myself going over twice. And I was upside down, as you can see from this photograph, pinned underneath. There are various reasons why these cars were dangerous to drive. One was the horsepower, too much horsepower for its chassis. Another reason was that the engine, the crankshaft, is, there is only two bearing crankshaft in these cars. And some of these cars have been known to go as high as 10,000 RPM. So prevent, to prevent the engine from blowing up, they had to construct a completely different crankshaft with this huge counterweight to balance the crankshaft. And a friend of mine who owns number two, Colin Tish, has Hamilton's number two. His father told me 
that he saw him in a race go airborne, and while the car was in air, the thing just rolled over. And he claims that what happens here, you know, the, the car wants to rotate around the crankshaft. It takes the gyro effect. And I'm sure this is why they only made nine. But before, at this point, they were making record breaker cars. They were going straight, but as soon as they set this whole setup in sports cars, they had problems. The light green car is a 1933 car, it was uh, the first of the swept wings, um, came out in August uh, 1933 and then officially out at the motor show in 19, uh, uh, that year. Um, so this car actually predates the, the motor show and it has a number of modifications um, because it was uh, raced at Brooklands, uh, the, the owner in 1934 um, put on larger headlights and uh, all sorts of modifications to the engine and so on. So it's not quite uh, standard but um, you know they're all legitimate uh, modifications for the, for the, for the period. Uh, the, whereas the other, the other MG uh, is also a J2 but it is um, a year earlier and uh, therefore has the cycle wings uh, but basically the same car same engine same capacity of 847 cc's and um, that has just been recently out of restoration that one whereas uh, my car uh, the the swept wing one uh, has never been restored it was uh, repainted about 12 or 13 years ago but it's never had a, a chassis up restoration and <laughs> so it's uh, rather rather unique really we we've just taken the engine down actually and uh, had uh, had it all balanced and uh, and racing pistons uh, and and put in and so on but uh, there's the the crank is uh, a 1934 crank uh, which was replaced by the factory uh, because they broke the first one uh, which was a common fault in uh, with J2s and because uh, only two bearing it's uh, it's not an easy car to drive when you first uh, start with them because you have a crash box and so therefore you've got a double D clutch and uh, the brakes aren't uh, particularly powerful so uh, you've got to think farther ahead uh, for your braking but otherwise it and of course the suspension is very hard but um, it, you get the feel of everything it's uh, you're you're in contact with the car whereas modern cars I feel you're remote they built 22 J3s and 9 J4s. So the 22 J3s that were built, 16 still exist. This is a J3, it's got the J3 frame, it will always be a J3, J3 chassis, always be a J3. However, it has the authentic body from a J4, J4004. Um, this was put on prior to 1950. Um, it was not uncommon to change bodies back then. In fact, this body was on J4003, another J4, and it came from J4003 to this car. Um, it is, as all, let me just back up and say, the J3s and J4s were the only supercharged J-types. Um, this came with a Power Plus supercharger from the factory. This is a Marshall Power Plus. This didn't last. Uh, you had a choice. You could upgrade your Power Plus uh, to a higher boost for a few pounds back then. Uh, it is, it's got the engine, uh, thank, thanks to Tom and, and Pete Thielander and Chris. It has the engine from J4005 in it that we're able to acquire. Uh, J, it is a, it is a uh, 746cc uh, engine so that it could, it could run in races at 750cc's or less in a supercharged race. A J4 engine is different from a J3 and anyone uh, from a J2. And any of you who went to Tom's talk at, in Gatlinburg saw that between uh, the cylinders in this engine, there's airspace. Not so with a J2. That's so that the cylinders could expand and contract concentrically. Um, this this uh, car had an oil pump initially. Uh, all, everything was uh, in place. A dual plate cut clutch. <coughs> J4s, as this one, are all alloy bodies for racing. Uh, the dash was different when I got it. We had James Gunn, uh, who had experience with J4005, uh, do a, uh, a meticulous recreation of that <coughs> dash and sent it back, and then Tom took it from there. Uh, it has uh, uh, the two lines that you see in the back are the dual fuel pumps. Fuel pump one and fuel pump two could be switched on from the dashboard in the case of a of a failure. Imagine that. Um, and what else? Um, I had the car for, let's see, 
I'm the third owner. It came to the country, to the U.S. in 1947 uh, years ago. I've had it for 10 years, and I'm the third owner over here in the uh, in the states. And um, it's a lot of fun. <coughs> Sure, this is a swept wing 1933 MGJ2, which was manufactured in Great Britain. Uh, it's a pre-war car, which will be vintage racing here today at the Groton Raceway. Some of the, the more interesting features, I'd say, would be the, uh, it's got an overhead camshaft um, instead of a pushrod engine. It uh, has a cross-flow head, which makes it breathe very nicely. It has, it has a lot of the um, older, prettier castings on the car still. Some of that seemed to get lost in the translation when MG was taken over. Um, I think it's, it's distinctive in its size. It's quite small. It only has an 847cc engine. Um, it only has a two main bearing crankshaft, uh, the front of which being a ball bearing and the rear being poured. So it's, it's the smallest car I think you'll see out here today as far as displacement, um, to my knowledge. The uh, film company which used my first car, which was an MG J2 model, 1933. The cream car which we see on the left behind me um, is very similar to my J2 and it was spotted by a film person who recommended that I should visit Pinewood Studios with it. Uh, for them to review and uh, assess its capabilities and potential for use in the film. The film being Death on the Nile. This uh, car was duly used in the film and uh, if you are fortunate enough to see it, we uh, have a few seconds at the start of the film. <laughs>